Welcome at NCU UFA Academy Lectures. NCU UFA Academy uh, Lectures are uh, supposed to give students, citizens and uh, uh, staff uh, to give a feel of UFA. Uh, UFA is one of the 41 uh, alliances which uh, has got a chance to um, uh, to uh, build and test the European University. Our first lecturer today is Professor Eva Binczyk. Welcome. Wow. And she will tell us about the uh, paradoxes of Anthropocene. Uh, if you have any questions during the lectures, please write them on chat and then after the lecture, Professor Binczyk will answer them. At least I will try. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much for the invitation and for your time. And at the university we are very happy that we are part of the UFA network. It's very good. And um, as uh, Gosia have told you, my title is Paradoxes of the Anthropocene. And I am a philosopher of science, but also a sociologist. And in my last book, uh, entitled The Epoch of Man, uh, rhetoric and lethargy of the Anthropocene, I tried to research on the discourses of the debate on the Anthropocene, the so-called Epoch of Man. And during my research I found that this is a very amazing debate and a very interdisciplinary one. And it is unusual even this that uh, within this debate climatologists and geologists uh, could uh, uh, talk together and communicate together. But this debate is also very important politically, as you will see, and this is full, it's full of incredible emotions. Uh, during my presentation, I decided to show you several slides with the so-called the glossary of the Anthropocene that I uh, prepared at the end of my book. And those glossaries are the notions within the narrations on the global planetary environmental crisis uh, the notions that are most frequently used, that repeat themselves, and in my opinion, those are also very interesting metaphors. And I think that those slides with the glossary of the Anthropocene will help us to illustrate my topic. Uh, in this speech, I won't uh, talk to you about uh, the whole debate, but uh, we will focus only on five paradoxical structures, the structures of contradiction concerning the concept of the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene and visible in the debate. So my aim is to bring it out for you, and I have chosen five such uh, interesting paradoxical topics. I think that they really torment this debate. The first one concerns the very category of the Anthropocene. The second one uh, concerns the condition of the environmentalism in the post-natural world. And the third one uh, will be devoted to the shocking contrast between hyper-agency of the few and the helplessness of the many in our epoch. The fourth one is about the massive scale of radical political challenges in the epoch of urgency that we face today. And the last one will be about the necessity of meaningful social mobilization in the context of the paralysis and denialism that we have uh, in the 21st century. So let me start with the concept of the Anthropocene. The very idea when it started, it was introduced by two very well-known uh, scientists, especially Paul Crutzen, because Paul Crutzen was uh, a Nobel Prize winner in the chemistry of the atmosphere, but also Eugen Stermer, who is uh, a biologist and he researched oceans. And those two scientists, they introduced into the discussion the proposition that we should stop talking about Holocene and start talking about the Anthropocene, the epoch of man, in order to emphasize that in the second half of the 20th, 20th century, after the Second World War, Homo sapiens understood as a species, so here Homo sapiens is understood uh, in a universalizing way, became a driving force of planetary significance, which resembled geological forces, so that was the idea. Well, as you probably know, this debate has an important uh, stratigraphic and geological background. The debate would be also not possible, I think, uh, if were not for the achievements of the so-called earth system science. 
hundreds of scientists uh, in very many reports uh, have shown us that something really dangerous is happening to our planetary systems. Here you see uh, the first part of this vocabulary of the Anthropocene, in which you have so many notions and interesting metaphors that revolve, in my opinion, around the very serious problem of our irreversibility. I think that we may name our epoch as the epoch of irreversible losses. Here you have, for example, the notion of uh, domino effect or the most famous, I think, tipping point. The tipping point, for example, of the global warming temperature that we do not want to have uh, our earth warmer than for 1.5 degrees of Celsius. You can see here the planetary boundaries ideas that we will, we will talk about them later. And so many like defiant Earth or planetary terra incognita, all of them invented by scientists from different disciplines to show us that this problem of irreversi irreversibility may define uh, the current age. And hundreds of scientists, uh, they show us that we have a huge problem of destabilization of the atmosphere. You know that today we are talking about cat climate catastrophe. We are talking about an abrupt, uh, rapid climate change. We have a huge problem of this acidification of the oceans and destabilization of the whole hydrosphere and the loss of fertile soils. Uh, it is not so visible in public debates, but there are assessments in which uh, it's stated that we have only 60 years of crops left because our soils are so degraded and we do not regenerate them properly. So we have a monstrous problem of the great sixth extinction also, the loss of diversity. And in some reports you may read that we live in the epoch of annihilation of biosphere. So what characterizes the notion of the Anthropocene and the whole debate, in my opinion, is that we are constantly thinking and talking here about the enormous scale of planetary destruction, the enormous scale and proportions of human intervention into the ecosystems. The Anthropocene is also an epoch in which we need experts very badly. The coronavirus pandemic showed us that this is true very well, I think. As you may have heard also, pandemic is described as a trailer to climate change. It's a very disturbing idea. The Anthropocene is a time of increasingly difficult relations between humankind and environment. Our problems stem from the fact that we do not respect biodiversity, that we take space away from other species simply by take, taking their habitats. We simply live too close to them. And the resilience of animals is weakened because the populations are smaller and weaker and zoonotic disease and viruses like coronavirus are being transmitted. We were warned by scientists that this was a threat to us that such scenarios would be possible. And the World Health Organization has now gained in authority during the pandemic. But, you know, with the anti-vaccination movement, uh, we know that not everyone turns to the experts. Many analysts say that the problem of climate change, the risk of planetary systems simply going out of balance, is a problem that we also need to feel not only think about it intellectually, not only reflect upon it, but also feel it. And in order to change ourselves and start acting and reacting politically according, accordingly, we need performers, art, artists, and also uh, people who write literatures, literature writers to show us how those emotions uh, can be absorbed. So, of course, in the debate, you have also philosophers, but also historians of the environment. A lot of anthropologists, especially anthropologists of the um, energy, also some journalists, um, political scientists now, recently. And there is still not enough economists. 
Maybe you've heard about this, that uh, very famous economist Nicholas Stern and with his friend Andrew Oswald, they, in one of his recent uh, article, they simply apologized humankind, they apologized for the fact that economics is failing humanity by not taking into account environmental costs. So it is a really exceptional debate and it has these certain paradoxes and let me move to the first one. The first such contradictory structure uh, I would like to talk to you about concerns the concept itself. So here you have the word anthropos, what means, which means man. The idea is to say that we no longer live in the Holocene but in the Anthropocene, the epoch of man. This would seem to sound even proud, yes, but this means that the label of man comes back into our discussion again. And in fact, in this day and age, in the 21st century and even at the end of the 20th century, a lot of people, a lot of intellectuals, especially within the humanities, they said that we should be ashamed of anthropocentrism. We want to move, they wanted us to move to environmental humanities, to move to some post-anthropocentric positions, anti-anthropocentric. So our problem is precisely that we've always put the human being at the center. We no longer want this anthropocentrism. And look, it's happening again. It's happening again in terms of the label itself. It is quite paradoxical. We, in the era of the need for planetary co-responsibility, but not for anthropocentrism, we need such an awareness of how intertwined the fate of man is with so many non-human, non-humans, non-human factors. Viruses, bacteria, species that are living us every day, clean water, clean air, microorganisms that live in the soil. We should no longer constantly say man, man, and man. And in the very concept of the Anthropocene, this is what is contained. So it is paradoxical and some commentators are also outraged that the very name is already ill-conceived, that the very name upholds what we were supposed to avoid. We were no longer supposed to be anthropocentric, we were supposed to stop, but we still cannot. And this is why so many other scholars proposed alternative names for the Anthropocene epoch, because not only um, not the whole human species is resp responsible for the global planetary environmental crisis. So you have here the proposition of the Anglocene, because uh, a lot of people responsible talked English, speak English as a native language, uh, who are responsible for emissions and who were responsible, responsible in the history for emissions of greenhouse gases. There is this proposition of capitalism, the most famous one, I think, because a lot of people uh, think that the mechanisms of hypercapitalism and free market is in fact responsible for our attitude towards the environment, environment for our exploitation, for our scale, the scale of our exploitation. Uh, we may go, uh, we may uh, uh, come back to this, uh, to every of uh, my slides later in the discussion, but now let's go further. Let me move to the second paradoxical structure in the Anthropocene debate. In my opinion, there is a ser serious conceptual tension here, because the debate on the Anthropocene, it culminates around 2010. So we are talking about the most recent texts about the planetary environmental crisis in the 21st century, in fact. Particularly the grim is the risk of the whole atmosphere being thrown out of balance in the uh, uh, coming decades. And scientists, experts are talking here about decades, even two decades, not centuries. And all of this is described as some how an all-encompassing stage for the development of humankind, for thinking about humanity throughout the century that, just has, that has just begun. And now you will find in many areas, and I myself proclaim it in my articles and my book, that what the 21st century needs is a decisive climatic adjustment of all of our thinking. 
a pro-environmental climatic correction. First of all, of a common sense in, of economics, of a common sense in terms of how we manage the earth economically, how we use the, and exploit the earth. Because it turns out that its resources, the resources of earth will not last much longer, that planetary systems will not be able to withstand how powerfully we exploit them. So here we have this idea of climate correcting, cor climatic correction of economics. We have the idea of calling for climate correcting and our political thinking to build a new policies. Our ide idea is to take account, into account the fact that we are living in unprecedented time when there is a risk of destabilization of planetary systems and to take account of this also in our sociological thinking, in our thinking about societies and especially in our thinking about new social innovations and institutions that we so badly need nowadays. Of course, the same applies to philosophy. I think this is that climate catastrophe is really a philosophical problem and even an existential one, existential one. So that is to say, the Anthropocene is the epoch of a powerful impulse to climate correct every thought in the 21st century. Because without this, we will not be able to introduce the necessary solutions in time. And now, see here, this postulates for climatic and pro-environmental correction, which so ma many people of various disciplines are calling for today, appear at a time when we find out that there is no longer environment, no longer any environment. We live in a post-natural world, post-environmental epoch. Precisely the Anthropocene is an epoch of hybrid, intertwined relations of entities altered by humans, altered by human activity. For example, like this plastisphere, the great Pacific Ocean garbage patch that is so huge, like the whole Eastern Europe. Anthropocene is a time when we soon will have more plastic than fish in the oceans, where we have tilted the Earth's axis a bit, because the Greenland ice sheet has melted and its gravity has changed, where we have uh, levels of ocean acidification unprecedented on thousands of years on Earth. There have been changes of millions of years in terms of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and these are really post-environmental times. There is no longer any nature, there is no wild nature, no intact, untouched nature. And paradoxically, we are setting about correcting everything pro-environmentally when that environment no longer exists. So this is the second such paradoxical structure that plagues us today, I think, in our 21st century. What is also very sad to me personally, I was looking for the po political postulates within the narrations of the Anthropocene, and I may tell you that we are no longer talking about uh, prevention. We are only talking about adaptation. For prevention, it is already too late. We are not talking about protecting nature. The only political aim in the narration is to manage irreversible losses. It is very sad, in my opinion, and it is not ambitious at all. That's all we can afford today. The third structure, structure I would like to tell you about is one that is related to the notion of agency. There would be no debate about the Anthropocene if it were not for the partly even arrogant admiration of sub super powerfulness of the species Homo sapiens. We live at a time when we have recycled 75% of the biosphere, when we are using 50% of the clean drinking water resources, when we have destroyed 50% of the fertile soils on the planet. So the scale, these proportions are uh, simply shocking, uh, which is wh why I think so many experts enter this debate amazed by the mathematical scale, by the proportion or disgust maybe, because some of them talk about aesthetic taste, that this is so simply something 
our aesthetics cannot afford or even about ethical emptiness because we are not having ethical notions to think about it, what we are doing in fact. So this is what characterizes human environment relations in the 20 and in the 21st century. And I tried to show you this scale and the proportion, the question of proportion on those two pictures. So, <clears throat> so what we have here is a hyperhuman agency, and some say that the Anthropocene will be the, even the epoch where humanity will create its own climate, or capitalism will create its own climate through uh, regulation of the thermostat of the earth through climate engineering or geoengineering, for example, putting sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere to cool our atmosphere a little bit. This is also the time when we think we will turn the earth into a planetary garden. That's how powerful we are. You do indeed have visible motives of hyper-causality in this debate. And basically this notion of the Anthropocene was introduced to show that the human species has become so powerful that it is rivaling the geological forces. And the consequences of our actions will leave a mark on Earth, on its strat stratosphere, strat Tigraphic strata, <laughs> and this mark will uh, stay in the ground for millions of years. This is like a stigma on the stratigraphic strata that uh, hundreds of years or millions of years will uh, uh, be as a symbol to remember that Homo sapiens lived there. However, when we think about the epoch of hyper agency, uh, we know that this is only the agency of a few. We know that uh, we live in the epoch in which inequalities rise each year, and even the pandemic gave the richest more money and made the 50% of the global poorest even poorer every day. So we also know that responsible for the 50% of the emissions are people it's 20% of humankind, people who live in OECD countries like Poland. So not everybody is responsible in, a sa in the same way and not everybody can be powerful in the Anthropocene. We know that, I, I tried to show this for you using this photo, we know that prosperous and carbon-laden life of wealthy societies in the West depend on energy, cheap labor, materials, and devastation, devastation of the peripheries. And uh, some scholars will use here the notion of the extractivism of the Anthropocene. This helplessness has also this uh, other difficult dimension, dimension. This is the era, the Anthropocene, of the arrogant causality of certain Homo sapiens, but most of us are completely helpless in the face of these harmful, harmful processes. Is it the epoch of agency or rather of super hyper helplessness? Most of us will be victims of climate change. It is estimated that by 2050, according to the World Bank, we will have 140 million climate refugees. Island states will disappear and there will be problems for cities on the ocean coastline and the majority of people on the earth, they live in such cities. So weather anomalies, people in poor developing countries are not prepared for them at all because they, there is no insurance systems there. So most of us are rather completely helpless than powerful. We are also living in a time when climate policy and environmental policy is not satisfactory to say at least. On this picture, it may look funny, but it also makes uh, us rather nervous and also unhappy because 
on this picture, somebody tried to show the contrast between our ambitious aims, our wonderful documents about uh, our ideas, how we should proceed. And this is contrasted with the reality, with the implementation, with the situation as it looks like in uh, reality. We are still doing too little, you may say. We are losing face even by doing basically nothing. So it is still not enough politically. Climate activists uh, like Greta Thunberg, who started the youth clim climate strikes, is right, I think, when she says to adults, how dare you? Young people are helpless. Politicians are not listening to scientists. A sense of helplessness is growing among experts. I've read several books in which climatologists seemed so frustrated that they are not listened to by politicians, that they feel guilty, that they should invent even more reports, even more metaphors, even better language, because the language maybe is not good. I don't think so, this is the case. Those who are not listened to and who are shunned, who are ridiculed as alarmists, in my opinion, are today completely losing ground. These are times when helplessness is the daily bread of the majority of the Earth's citizens, not super agency. Yet the concept of the Anthropocene would suggest that these times are the times of hyper-agility. So here you have the third such very painful, I think, and dramatic paradox of the Anthropocene. Let me move to the fourth par paradox, which I would like to discuss with you. Well, we knew as early as in the 1970s, or even earlier, scientists alarmed us in 1950s that we were going to have a huge problem of global warming, of climate destabilization. And despite the fact that so many decades have passed, nothing concrete has yet been established. The Anthropocene is considered to be, as you may see on this uh, title of this book, is been considered as the epoch of such a feeling that we are urgently need changes. It's the epoch of urgency. It is also <laughs> an epoch that has even been described as there is too late to see. There is simply too late. Commenta commentators often say it is already too late. According to thousands of experts who warn us in special documents, uh, in special letters addressed to humanity, we simply jeopardize our future. This is a warning, the last warning of experts from July this year, in which um, there are positive postulates that should be um, introduced into the global system, global economic system. Uh, I wanted to show you how ambitious, how difficult those postulates are. We know that important policy action should be undertaken, tax changes, moving away from fossil, fu fossil fuel subsides, because we still subside fossil fuel, punishing those responsible for misinformation on climate change. They are prosecuted now for example, in New York, but they are not still punished. All of this should have been done the day before yesterday. So we are in a paradoxical, difficult position of an epoch of urgency, of a sense of urgency that we are in a hurry. It is now paradoxical that in precisely such an epoch, we need to look at those postulates. We need to decarbonize our entire world. This is an incredible undertaking. It is paralyzing to say that we need new infrastructures to move away from fossil fuels. We need low carbon, high, not high emissions entertainment. We should forget about high emission entertainment. We need to move away from screens because the internet is also very high carbon and our, even our lecture today. We need to move away from the long distance trade that we have pursued in the age of globalization, because that trade too is carbon intensive. 
We absolutely have to move away from industrial animal husbandry. Above all, as you may see on this postulate, red meat production. We should change our diet globally to a plant-based diet. We need to build cities in a completely different way so that they do not favor cars over us, over public transport, over walking and cycling. In fact, we need to live differently. We need to use energy differently. We also need to cool down growth in the richest societies in the West. We need to slow down the consumption of resources and the consumption, consumption of fuel there. We all understand the enormity of the challenge and now we have to do something like this as a matter of urgency. So you have another paradox. The scale of the challenge requires, according to all sociologists, diagnosticians and political scientists, extreme caution, extreme calmness in order to do this in the mode, as sociologists would say, of a so-called learning society, which gradually experiments with those, these solutions. So as not to do them foolishly, so as not to do them over the dead bodies of the weakest, at the expense of those who are oppressed, silenced and weaker, as not to do them haphazardly, in order not to generate new conflicts. So how are we supposed to do all this when through our slackness and inaction, we have come to the point where tomorrow is too late, yesterday is too late. The day before yesterday, we should have acted. So you understand the structure here and this tension of the urgency procedure, which is just starting to being introduced, for example, by European Green Deal, explains that we speak of a state of emergency, that we have those climate alarms. We want to raise these alarms by understanding what is happening. Young people are, are raising these alarms. This is understandable, but also very dangerous. Our inaction and passivity are very dangerous, but climate alarms are also dangerous. The politics of the future of the coming decades will require really an incredible amount of wisdom from our decision makers, from our politicians. Do we hope that they will show us this wisdom in the century of populism that we observe all over the world? Can it be done on such a basis, basis of a peaceful learning society? Please simply vote. We should vote for people who will able to do this, but do they really exist? So finally, the last of our paradoxes. We know that, and I think I did not want to burden you with empirical data I'd either, we know that science has already done, done its work. The experts have done their work. We have good knowledge, a very well documented. It is estimated that climatology is one of the best documented sciences at the moment. We do not need another report saying that a million species is going to die out. We do not need another report saying that we should have stopped emitting greenhouse gases 50 years ago. The experts who work for us defined for us the so-called planetary boundaries that you see on this slide within this framework of the so-called Earth system science. In other words, those planetary boundaries are the parameters that we cannot exceed if we want to preserve the life we know from the Holocene epoch. If we want to keep our agriculture, our insurance systems, everything we call civilization, the organized order of life with human rights, if we want to keep all this, then we cannot cross the planetary boundaries. And now I want to say that the paradox of the Anthropocene is that really is the scale of this data that is paralyzing. I read in many articles and books that it has such a narcotic effect. You have the problem of climate depression. Maybe you've heard about the eco sickness, the problem of ecological grief, Anthropocene disorder even or even pre-traumatic stress disorder. You have the problem of the nihilism, 
the passivity, basically the stupor and lethargy in which we are stuck. So this data only overwhelms us further. But shall we stop listening to the experts? I don't think this is the solution. In the paralysis that is the Anthropocene, what we really need is action at the same time. Look at this glossary, how powerful it is, collective recklessness, conspiracy of silence, all of those metaphors have been used by different people from different disciplines within the debate about the seriousness of global planetary environmental crisis. You have a little bit outdated slide. It says about the year 2100. And we know that we have so many estimations that we will have such global warming of 3 degrees of Celsius or even 4 degrees of Celsius within the next decades, 2070, 2080, IPCC says. In this uh, slide, Professor Kevin, Kevin Anderson, a very well-known climatologist, say, says simply that this kind of future is not compatible with an organized global community. So this is how it looks like. And what is depressing, this is a little bit old slide, when our global warming been 0 0.8 of degrees of Celsius, now it's 1.1 degrees of Celsius. So it's really going very quickly, changing very quickly. So in an epoch of paralysis, we are all paralyzed in the Anthropocene and overwhelmed, you may say, but this, that, that the scale looks like by the depletion, depletion of resources, by the threat of wars over water, by the threat of major droughts, fires, heat waves weather anomalies and so on. And so paralyzed, in fact, we are supposed to start acting in a meaningful way. And in my opinion, this is the last st structure that I wanted to talk to you about, the last paradox of the Anthropocene. Uh, but uh, let me just add something. I, I have uh, three more slides about my current uh, standpoint. After finishing my book and publishing the book in 2018, I have been working on a project in which I want to boycott this lethargy, in which I want to boycott this inertia that has been described to you uh, so far. To show, I invented this metaphor of the eco verve in economics, to show that on the basis of the discourses we have the ideas of activists, artists and scientists, that there are constructive examples of how we could, despite everything, think of a positive and even promising future, a future for next generations. It sounds desperate and this is how the Anthropocene looks like, but we do not have any other option. So, despite the fact that the 21st century has already been hailed as the century of the lost future, we have no, no choice but to desperately seek optimism, to reach for optimism, I think, when I, have, when I am strong enough to do this, of course, not all the time, to reach for optimism at a time when it seems that optimism simply does not pay. After um, uh, publishing my book, I've been particularly interested in the disciplinary dictionary of economic, economics, economic sciences. I think uh, that's the reason is that it's on the side of our thinking about the economy and the agency within the markets uh, lies the greatest responsibility when, in com in, when it comes to the scale of destruction, resource intensity, and the fact that we still cannot escape from our dependence on fossil fuels. And I propose that we should build a new dictionary for a new common sense of, and here I really recommend you ecological economics and the so-called degrowth economics to do this. Clearly, the old dictionary is not working. It is the old common sense that is bringing humanity to the brink of disaster. When I talk to activists, they show me that, according to the old common sense dictionary, it is not worth changing humanity. 
It is not work escaping from this path to the extinction. No one, not the richest, not the corporations, uh, is going to make money out of it. The oil companies are not going to do it because they rather continue to invest in fossil fuels. Insurance funds and our banks, they continue to invest in fossil fuels. It does not pay for humanity to survive. It pays for humanity simply to become extinct. But this structure, this structure is no longer worth cultivating. And I hope that you're thinking in the similar way. Everything must be done to break it down, to make it absurd and to make it immoral as soon as possible because there is no time lef left. And I think that Professor Zygmunt Bauman uh, thought in a similar way when he wrote in his book Retrotopia this sentence that we, the inhabitants of the earth, are now in a very unique situation, unprecedented one. Either we join hands and build this solidarity to decarbonize the whole world, to build those green deals, or we share a common grave. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. That was my last uh, slide, um, and all the paradoxes have been presented, and also at the end my, st my uh, current standpoint in, in face of those paradoxes. Thank you very much, Professor Binczyk. Thank you, all the listeners, for your attention. Uh, Professor Binczyk is from our Institute of Philosophy at, uh, at NCU. And the next uh, Youth uh, Academy lecture will be completely different. Uh, we invite you for that. Um, uh, it's going to take place in, on the 12th of October at 5 p.m. and it will be Professor uh, Michał Wiciński will, uh, and he will te tell you about marijuana, facts and myths. So uh, the UFA team uh, is forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.